Animal Farm, Chapter 8, Part 2. The very next morning, the attack came. The animals were at breakfast when the lookouts came racing in with the news that Frederick and his followers had already come through the five-barred gate. Boldly enough, the animals sallied forth to meet them, but this time they did not have the easy victory that they had had in the Battle of Cowshed. There were 15 men with half a dozen guns between them, and they opened fire as soon as they got within 50 yards. The animals could not face the terrible explosions and the stinging pellets, and in spite of the efforts of Napoleon and Boxer to rally them, they were soon driven back. A number of them were already wounded. They took refuge in the farm buildings and peeped cautiously out from chinks and knotholes. The whole of the big pasture, including the windmill, was in the hands of the enemy. For the moment, even Napoleon seemed at loss. He paced up and down without a word, his tail rigid and twitching. Wistful glances were sent in the direction of Foxwood. If Pilkington and his men would help them, the day might yet be won. But at this moment, the four pigeons who had been sent out the day before returned, one of them bearing a scrap of paper from Pilkington. On it was penciled the words, Serves you right. Meanwhile, Frederick and his men had halted about the windmill. The animals watched them, and a murmur of dismay went around. Two of the men had produced a crowbar and a sledgehammer. They were going to knock the windmill down. Impossible, cried Napoleon. We have built the walls far too thick for them. They could not knock it down in a week. Courage, comrades. But Benjamin was watching the movements of the men intently. The two with the hammer and crowbar were drilling a hole near the base of the windmill. Slowly, with an air almost of amusement, Benjamin nodded his long muscle. I thought so, he said. Do you see what they're doing? In another moment, they're going to pack blasting powder into that hole. Terrified, the animals waited. It was impossible now to venture out of the shelter of the buildings. After a few minutes, the men were seen to be running in all directions. Then there was a deafening roar. The pigeons swirled into the air, and all the animals except Napoleon flung themselves flat on their bellies and hid their faces. When they got up again, a huge cloud of black smoke was hanging where the windmill had been. Slowly, the breeze drifted it away. The windmill had ceased to exist. At this sight, the animals' courage returned to them. The fear and despair they had felt a moment earlier were drowned in their rage against this vile, contemptible act. A mighty cry of vengeance went up, and without waiting for further orders, they charged forth in a body and made straight for the enemy. This time, they did not heed the cruel pellets that swept over them like hail. It was a savage, bitter battle. The men fired again and again, and when the animals got too close quarters, lashed out with their sticks and their heavy boots. A cow, three sheep, and two geese were killed, and nearly everyone was wounded. Even Napoleon, who was directing operations from the rear, had the tip of his tail clipped by a pellet. But the men did not go unscathed either. Three of them had their heads broken by blows from boxers' hooves. Another was gored in the belly by a cow's horn. Another had his trousers nearly torn off by Jesse and Bluebell. And when the nine dogs and Napoleon's own bodyguard, whom he had instructed to make a detour under the cover of the hedge, suddenly appeared on the men's flanks, baying ferociously, panic overtook them. They saw that they were in danger of being surrounded. Frederick shouted to his men to get out while the going was good, and the next moment the cowardly enemy was running for dear life. The animals chased them right down to the bottom of the field and got in some last kicks at them as they forced their way through the thorn hedge. They had won, but they were weary and bleeding. Slowly they began to limp back toward the farm. The sight of their dead comrades stretched upon the grass moved some of them to tears. And for a little while, they halted in sorrowful silence at the place where the windmill had once stood. Yes, it was gone. Almost the last trace of their labor was gone. Even the foundations were partially destroyed. And in rebuilding it, they could not this time as before make use of the fallen stones. This time the stones had vanished too. The force of the explosion had flung them to distances of hundreds of yards. 
It was as though the windmill had never been. As they approached the farm, Squealer, who had unaccountably been absent during the fighting, came skipping toward them, whisking his tail and beaming with satisfaction. Any animals heard from the direction of the farm buildings the solemn booming of a gun. What is that gun firing for? asked Boxer. To celebrate our victory, cried Squealer. What victory? said Boxer. His knees were bleeding. He had lost a shoe and split his hoof, and a dozen pellets had lodged themselves in his hind leg. What victory, comrade? Have we not driven the enemy off our soil, the sacred soil of Animal Farm? But they have destroyed the windmill, and we had worked on it for two years. What matter? We will build another windmill. We will build six windmills if we feel like it. You do not appreciate, comrade, the mighty thing that we have done. The enemy was in occupation of this very ground that we stand upon. And now, thanks to the leadership of Comrade Napoleon, we have won every inch of it back. Then we have won back what we had before, said Boxer. That is our victory, said Squealer. They limped into the yard. The pellets under the skin of Boxer's legs smarted painfully. He saw ahead of him the heavy labor of rebuilding the windmill from the foundations, and already in imagination he braced himself for the task. But for the first time it occurred to him that he was 11 years old and that perhaps his great muscles were not quite what they had once been. But when the animals saw the green flag flying and heard the gun firing again, seven times it was fired in all, and heard the speech that Napoleon made congratulating them on their conduct, It did seem to them, after all, that they had won a great victory. The animals slain in the battle were given a solemn funeral. Boxer and Clover pulled the wagon which served as a hearse, and Napoleon himself walked at the head of the procession. Two whole days were given over to celebrations. There were songs, speeches, and more firing of the gun, and a special gift of an apple was bestowed on every animal, with two ounces of corn for each bird, and three biscuits for each dog. It was announced that the battle would be called the Battle of the Windmill, and that Napoleon had created a new decoration, the Order of the Green Banner, which he had conferred upon himself. In the general rejoicings, the unfortunate affair of the banknotes was forgotten. It was a few days later, then, that the pigs came upon a case of whiskey in the cellars of the farmhouse. It had been overlooked at the time when the house was first occupied. That night there came from the farmhouse the sound of loud singing in which, to everyone's surprise, the strains of Beasts of England were mixed up. At about half past nine, Napoleon, wearing an old bowler hat of Mr. Jones's, was distinctly seen to emerge from the back door, gallop rapidly around the yard, and disappear indoors again. But in the morning a deep silence hung over the farmhouse. Not a pig appeared to be stirring. It was nearly nine o'clock when Squealer made his appearance, walking slowly and dejectedly, his eyes dull, his tail hanging limply behind him, and with every appearance of being seriously ill. He called the animals together and told them that he had a terrible piece of news to impart. Comrade Napoleon was dying. A cry of lamentation went up. Straw was laid down outside the doors of the farmhouse. The animals walked on tiptoe. With tears in their eyes, they asked one another what they should do if their leader were taken away from them. A rumor went around that Snowball had, after all, contrived to introduce poison into Napoleon's food. At eleven o'clock, Squealer came out to make another announcement. As his last act upon earth, Comrade Napoleon had pronounced a solemn decree. The drinking of alcohol was to be punished by death. By the evening, however, Napoleon appeared to be somewhat better, and the following morning Squealer was able to tell them that he was well on his way to recovery. By the evening of that day, Napoleon was back at work, and on the next day it was learned that he had instructed Wimper to purchase in Willingdon some booklets on brewing and distilling. A week later, Napoleon gave orders that the small paddock beyond the orchard which it had previously been intended to set aside as a grazing ground for animals who were past work, was to be plowed up. 
It had given out that the pasture was exhausted and needed reseeding, but it soon became known that Napoleon intended to sow it with barley. About this time, there occurred a strange incident which hardly anyone was able to understand. One night at about 12 o'clock, there was a loud crash in the yard, and the animals rushed out of their stalls. It was a moonlit night. At the foot of the end wall of the big barn, where the Seven Commandments were written, there lay a ladder broken in two pieces. Squealer, temporarily stunned, was sprawling beside it, and near at hand there lay a lantern, a paintbrush, and an overturned pot of white paint. The dogs immediately made a ring around Squealer and escorted him back to the farmhouse as soon as he was able to walk. None of the animals could form any idea as to what this meant, except old Benjamin, who nodded his muzzle with a knowing air and seemed to understand, but would say nothing. But a few days later, Muriel, reading over the Seven Commandments to herself, noticed that there was yet another of them which the animals had remembered wrong. They had thought that the fifth commandment was, no animal shall drink alcohol. But there were two words they had forgotten. Actually, the commandment read, no animal shall drink alcohol to excess. And we'll go on with chapter nine in the next video. What do you think? Are the animals remembering the commandments wrong all the time? <laughs> I love you guys, as Tigger says. Ta-ta for now.